Well, hello again, everybody. Welcome to the Xenography vlog. Today we're going to be having a look at this camera. This is the Kiev 3A. <laughs> So here is the mighty Kiev 3A and what can we say about it? Well, the first thing that you notice is that it has this housing on top which adds some considerable height to the camera and for that reason it's a little bit maligned these days I think because people prefer the smoother, cleaner lines of the uh, Kiev without the meter uh, and that's entirely understandable. It does give it rather cleaner lines and the poor old 3A, the metered version, does suffer a little bit with uh, an interruption to the line. It has a nice smooth line without this uh, housing on top. However, when we look at the 3A, I've not actually had one of these cameras before. I've never handled one before. This is the first one I've had. Um, and when we look at the 3A, when we look at the metered version, yes, it, it it is slightly awkward looking. It does have this fairly large housing on top and this fairly large uh, dial here for the meter uh, to control the meter and the exposure reading. But I think it has a charm all of its own. And it does have a sort of an ugly duckling beauty about it. It's actually very nice. This camera's really grown on me. Uh, the longer I've had it, the more I've seen it, the more I've used it. Uh, it has actually grown on me quite a lot. And uh, I think we can certainly overlook any criticism about the line and the appearance of the camera. Uh, it doesn't really add a great deal of bulk. What's this, an inch at the most? Um, and you do get the benefit of actually having a meter. This version is a 1955 version. It's actually one of the rarer versions. Most of the Kievs are the later versions, which certainly by reputation were not as well made. This being a 1955 version, it was probably a little closer to the Contacts original uh, on which it was designed. So if you're not sure of the history of the Kiev, uh, I'll give you a few details. So what happened was, at the end of World War II, the entire factory that actually made these cameras in Dresden was legitimately given to the Russian uh, army, the Russian government, as war reparations. So the whole factory was taken to Kiev in the Ukraine. Um, and in fact, most of the technicians, or a great many of the technicians, were also taken to the factory in the Ukraine. So this is, there's a strong case to be made to say that this is a contacts camera. It was made on contacts production lines. Um, it was made by the people who... Uh, created the original camera, the original contacts. They trained Russian people to uh, work on this camera and to help to manufacture it. So there really is a good case to say that this is actually the real thing. Um, especially this one, as it's a fairly early version, 1955. Uh, that's only 10 years after the war had ended. Um, and so the tooling was still in good condition. It hadn't worn, which happened later in the production run. The tolerances of the machine, the camera, were, were uh, to original contact specification. So we, can, we really can argue that this actually is a Russian contacts. And it does differ from the Russian Leica copies. This is, this is not a copy. This is made on original tooling by people who worked on the original contacts, rather than the approach that was taken with the Leica copies, the Russian Leica copies, which were simply reverse engineered copies uh, of those Leica cameras. So this is a little more authentic. 
Okay, let's have a look at it. What have we actually got here? Well, if we take off the lens cap, we can see that there is the familiar Jupiter 8 lens, an F2 lens, 50mm lens. It has the contacts mounting, of course, which is a little different. It's a bayonet mounting. So what we have to do, it's actually a, a little more difficult to remove than the uh, screw mount lenses, or certainly not quite as straightforward. Uh, if you can see, there's a little spring here. And all you do is you push down on that spring. And so we push down there and there we go, the lens comes off. So there's the Jupiter lens in Kiev mount, uh, or contacts mount. Um, it's slightly different to the, uh, like a thread mount lens in that uh, it has this narrower neck here, this narrower throat to fit into the camera. There are rumours that this lens is uh, not quite as good as the Leica thread mount version um, and has one or two of the elements removed. In fact, that isn't true. It's the same six elements on our design. So we'll just pop it on. We'll pop it on by lining up the marks. There's the, there's the red mark that you line up and there's the red mark on the camera. So we just pop that in there, twist, and we're on. So pretty straightforward, nice and easy. The problem comes when you want to mount other lenses, particularly the Jupiter 12, uh, the wide angle uh, Jupiter lens, which I've been using on uh, another Kiev, uh, the results of which I'll post up soon. But that lens is quite tricky to mount because of the various uh, methods of, of uh, driving the lens that the contacts design uses. So they can be a little more awkward to mount lenses on than the Leica thread mount versions. This camera is very well made. It has engravings everywhere. You can see the paint come out of the engraving. Here it's a beautiful script. It's got Latin and uh, Cyrillic lettering on it. Um, I'll have to, uh, as part of the restoration I'm undertaking on this camera, we need to get some black paint in there to just bring out the logo. Um, focusing on these cameras, I think I've mentioned before, is uh, done. Uh, you have to unlock it, and, and uh, in fact, it's. It works by this little wheel here. So you can see as I turn the wheel, there's an internal gearing system that drives the rotation of the lens. The Kievs have a long base rangefinder. The Leica rangefinder is probably about this sort of distance between the two windows. The Kiev has almost twice as much space between the two windows, and so it's said to be more accurate. Using the meter, well, selenium light meters. This has a built-in selenium light meter. To open it, we just flip it up like that, and there's the selenium cell in there that actually measures the light. It is said that these selenium light meters wear out over time, and they will if you leave them exposed to light. But in my experience, if you keep them in darkness when you're not using them, uh, they just simply don't wear out. I've, I've found these selenium meters to be very, very long lasting. Uh, I have several from the um, 1960s, 70s. Um, some of them are mounted within cameras, some of them are separate units. However, I don't find personally that that um, they are unreliable. They're still accurate after many, many years. So I don't think there's a particular problem there, personally. How do we use the Kiev meter? Well, let me demonstrate. Um, if we turn the camera on its back here, there's a window here for reading the uh, setting, the light settings. Um, 
the amount of light that's falling on it. And first of all, you will need to set your film speed. Uh, the film speed can be set using this top part, uh, sorry, this second ring of the uh, meter here, the, the, this sort of stack of dials. Um, it's set to 65 at the moment. The settings are in Ghost, which is the Russian standard for light settings, but it's very, very similar to ASA or ISO. So we've got 65, 130 there. So I usually set it for 100 uh, uh, ASA speed. It said it's about there. There's a lot of latitude with print film, so if you're using print film, negative film that is, uh, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So we've set the film speed. We have aperture readings on the second stage of the stack here. And we have shutter speed readings right down on the bottom of the stack here. So to use it, there's the dial. Uh, now I'm going to put a light on that dial and it will respond. Okay, so here's the light coming in. And you can see as we put the light on that meter the needle will move. So how do you actually find the reading? We've got, well, we've got some numbers on there. Um, but to actually find the reading, you need to turn this second dial here, the second one in the stack. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. It's the lower dial that you turn. And as you turn it, you can see I'm turning it and the needle's moving. You need to set it to be on that black diamond. So we've now set correctly for this light source. What we do then is, very simple, we just read off the markings. You can see that clearly. So we've got here shutter speed at the bottom. So let's say for one two, uh, one, one twenty fifth, we've got a roundabout f8, probably slightly wider than f8, somewhere between f8 and f5.6. Then we close the window there, make sure that uh, no unnecessary light falls upon it because uh, that can um, reduce the, the life of the meter. So it's always important to keep that closed. Right, so having done that, we would simply wind on here and then we set our shutter speed by lifting this dial. Shutter speeds are marked around the around the edge of the camera. So the shutter speed you can see here. I hope you can see that. I'll bring it a bit closer. Oh, it's focused on the wrong bit. Let's let's bring it closer. Okay, so we've got the speeds marked here. Uh, and there's a little cutout right here on the shutter dial, speed selector dial. And all you do is lift and drop it to whichever speed that you want. This camera goes up to 1 1,250th of a second. It's a very nice quiet click. Aperture is set in the traditional way, just around the, whoops, around the front of the lens here. So there's the aperture dial, and we just turn that to the point that we need. This version of the Jupiter has click stops, unlike the Leica versions, the little Leica thread mount versions. So pretty straightforward. There is a self timer 
to operate the self timer we use this button here there's this tiny little arrow on it pointing that way so we just move it that way lovely clockwork noise, all the mechanism whirring away there and it fires. So let's remove the back now. This Kiev by the way has a little foot that you can flip out or back when you're not using it so if you want to stand the camera up you just move that to this point and it stands nice and steady and it won't fall over forwards. That feature was deleted from later models uh, as these models were cheapened a little bit and made more simple to produce. So just as in the Leica cameras we have two uh, little uh, things here to turn to take off the back, two little catches, slide it downwards and there's the innards of the Kiev. Let's just uh, make sure that's right. So there are the insides of the Kiev, there's the shutter. And you'll notice that the shutter is a little different. In fact it's very different to the Leica type shutter. It's made not of cloth but of metal tiny metal slats, metal pieces, which are held together uh, I believe by some sort of cloth at the back there which uh, joins them all together. And it travels vertically rather than horizontally. Or should that be horizontally rather than vertically? Yes it should. So let's cock the shutter now. And there are the two blinds, you can see those two blinds there two curtains, they meet together and up we go, there's a second curtain there and we fire. Um, the shutter sound on these cameras is quieter than in the Leica type versions. Uh, they often work with quite a, quite a sharp clacking sound. This one is very quiet. I'll fire it again and take it off the top of the desk here so it doesn't resonate. And that's really a, a very quiet shot of sound. Uh, so there is the contact shutter. It's said to be rather more complex than the Leica type and perhaps a little more delicate. I'm not sure how true that is because I don't have a great amount of experience with these cameras. However, there are stories of um, the cords that pull the, the ribbons rather, that pull the uh, two shutter leaves or curtains breaking. They can break. So if you do have one of these cameras and it's quite an old one like this one, I would suggest be quite gentle as you adjust, or as you move this, uh, sorry, as you cock the shutter, be very gentle with it and then you don't put too much strain on those ribbons. There we go. This camera lacks a take-up spool, it doesn't have one. And that's a bit tricky if you want to do actual photography with it because of course there's nowhere for your film to wind on to. The Workaround, the fix, is, well, you can buy them. They're still around. You can buy them mostly from uh, sellers in the former USSR. Um, but you can also make one. There is a little trick for making one from the inside of a film canister, the spool that's within a, a, a standard 35mm film canister. So I'm going to be doing that, and I will show you how I do that. I'll film that process um, a little later on and show you how I get on with that. Unfortunately there are a couple of dents on this camera. There's one here and there's one here and that really is unfortunate. Um, and that is the result of the 
seller, the um, seller on a, uh, a well-known auction site, which I'm sure I don't need to name, um, not packing the camera terribly well as it was sent. So I was a little disappointed to see that. However, what I'm going to try and do is there are screws that hold on this top cover here, two little screws there. So I'm going to take off this top cover and uh, try and knock those out from inside with a little, little bit of uh, panel beating, a little bit of careful application of pressure. I'm going to try and get those out. Um, and that's one more thing to do in the restoration of this camera. Let's pop the back on again. So it's pretty simple to get on. There are channels here that you need to put the sides of this back into. So there's the channel and we make sure the back is located in those channels and then we just push it upwards like that. Turn the locks and the back is now on. This camera is in very nice condition. Um, these early Kievs had a leather covering to the body here which is very nice. Later ones had a plastic covering uh, but this has the original, very thin, very soft leather. There are no bumps on this camera. You can sometimes get bumps. I think it's from the uh, slight corrosion of the metal that was used. Uh, sometimes you will find little protrusions, little bumps. Those are well known. I think they, they're even known as contacts bumps. This one doesn't have any, so it's clearly been very well looked after at some point in its life. Probably for most of its life it's been treasured and cared for. Um, and it's in very nice condition now, apart from these two regrettable bumps there. But we'll, we'll do our best to knock those out and get rid of those. To rewind film, this is the rewind button. So you push that. That disengages the mechanism and you rewind using uh, which one now? It's this knob at the top here. It's got a little arrow on it there. Uh, so you holding the button down underneath, you simply turn until your film is rewound. So there we have it, the Kiev 3A from 1955, um, currently under restoration. Uh, I'm going to let you know how that restoration gets on in future uh, episodes. So once again, thanks very much everybody for watching and uh, I hope this has been useful. And if you want to try one of these cameras, they are not expensive. They, uh, I, I bought this one, uh, I think I paid £35 for it. Uh, it wasn't terribly well advertised um, and so I did take a little risk on it. There wasn't a lot of detail given in the advert although it did state that it was all working and indeed it is all working. But there's always a little risk. I took a little risk and um, it's it's paid off and I've got a nice camera uh, from it. So do try one if you fancy a little manual, all manual, analogue photography experience. Um, and uh, happy photography. Thank you for tuning in. And I will be back soon for the next instalment.